Argument 23. Although other resemblances of the Indian rites and customs to those of the Hebrews might be pointed out, not to seem tedious, I proceed to the last argument of the origin of the Indian Americans, which shall be from their own traditions, from the accounts of our English writers, and from the testimonies which the Spanish writers have given, concerning the primitive inhabitants of Peru and Mexico. The Indian tradition says, that their forefathers in very remote ages came from a far distant country, where all the people were of one color, and that in process of time they moved eastward, to their present settlements. So that, what some of our writers have asserted is not just, who say the Indians affirm, that there were originally three different tribes in those countries, when the supreme chieftain to encourage swift running, proposed a proportionable reward of distinction to each, as they excelled in speed in passing a certain distant river, as, that the first should be polished white, the second red, and the third black, which took place accordingly after the race was over. This story sprung from the innovating superstitious ignorance of the popish priests, to the southwest of us. Our own Indian tradition is literal, and not allegorical, and ought to be received, because people who have been long separated from the rest of mankind, must know their own traditions the best, and could not be deceived in so material, and frequently repeated an event. Though they have been disjoined through different interests, time immemorial, yet, the rambling tribes of northern Indians accepted, they aver that they came over the Mississippi from the westward, before they arrived at their present settlements. This we see verified by the western old towns they have left behind them, and by the situation of their old beloved towns, or places of refuge, lying about a west course from each different nation. Such places in Judea were chiefly built in the most remote parts of the country, and the Indians deemed those only as beloved towns, where they first settled. This tradition is corroborated by a current report of the old Chickasaw Indians to our traders, that about 40 years since, there came from Mexico some of the old Chickasaw nation, the Shishemikas, according to the Spanish accounts, in quest of their brethren, as far north as the Aquapar nation, about 130 miles above the Natchez old towns, on the south side of the Mississippi. But through French policy, they were either killed, or sent back, so as to prevent their opening a brotherly intercourse, as they had proposed. And it is worthy of notice, that the Muscogee cave, out of which one of their politicians persuaded them their ancestors formerly ascended to their present terrestrial abode, lies in the Nanhamge old town, inhabited by the Mississippi Natchez Indians, which is one of the most western parts of their old inhabited country. I hope I shall be excused in reciting their ancient oral tradition, from father to son to the present time. They say, that one of their cunning old religious men finding that religion did not always thrive best, resolved with himself to impose on his friend's credulity, and alter in some respects their old tradition. He accordingly pretended to have held for a long time a continual intercourse with their subterranean progenitors in a cave, above 600 miles to the westward of Charlestown in South Carolina, adjoining to the old Chikasa trading path. This people were then possessed of everything, convenient for human life, and he promised them fully to supply their wants, in a constant manner, without sweating in the field, the most troublesome of all things to manly brisk warriors. He insisted, that all who were desirous of so natural and beneficial a correspondence, should contribute large presents, to be delivered on the embassy, to their brethren to clear the old chain of friendship from the rust it had contracted, through the fault of cankering time. He accordingly received presents from most of the people, to deliver them to their beloved subterranean kindred, but it seems, they shut up the mouth of the cave, and detained him there in order to be purified. The old waste towns of the Chikasa lie to the west and southwest, from where they have lived since the time we first opened a trade with them, on which course they formerly went to war over the Mississippi, because they knew it best, and had disputes with the natives of those parts, when they first came from thence. Wisdom directed them then to connive at some injuries on account of their itinerant camp of women and children, for their tradition says, it consisted of 10,000 men, besides women and children, when they came from the west, and passed over the Mississippi. The fine breed of running wood horses they brought with them, were the present Mexican or Spanish barbs. They also aver, that their ancestors cut off, and despoiled the greatest part of a caravan, loaded with gold and silver, but the carriage of it proved so troublesome to them, that they threw it into a river where it could not benefit the enemy. 
If we join together these circumstances, it utterly destroys the fine Peruvian and Mexican temples of the sun, and which the Spaniards have lavishly painted from their own fruitful imaginations, to show their own capacity of writing, though at the expense of truth, and to amuse the gazing distant world, and lessen our surprise at the sea of reputed heathenish blood, which their avaricious tempers, and flaming superstitious zeal, prompted them to spill. If any English reader have patience to search the extraordinary volumes of the Spanish writers, or even those of His Catholic Majesty's chief historiographer, he will not only find a wild portrait, but a striking resemblance and unity of the civil and martial customs, the religious rites, and traditions, of the ancient Peruvians and Mexicans, and the North Americans, according to the manner of their moresque paintings, likewise, the very national name of the primitive Chicasa, which they style Shishemikas, and whom they repute to have been the first inhabitants of Mexico. However, I lay little stress upon Spanish testimonies, for time, an ocular proof have convinced us of the labored falsehood of almost all their historical narrations concerning every curious thing, relative to South America. They, were so divested of those principles inherent to honest inquirers after truth, that they have recorded themselves to be a tribe of prejudiced bigots, striving to aggrandize the Mahometan valor of about 900 spurious Catholic Christians, under the patronage of their favorite saint, as persons by whom heaven designed to extirpate those two great nominal empires of pretended cannibals. They found it convenient to blacken the natives with ill names, and report them to their demigod the Mufti of Rome, as sacrificing every day, a prodigious multitude of human victims to numerous idol gods. The learned world is already fully acquainted with the fossil of their histories, reason, and later discoveries condemn them. Many years have elapsed since I first entered into Indian life, besides a good acquaintance with several southern Indians, who were conversant with the Mexican Indian rites and customs, and it is incontrovertible that the Spanish monks and Jesuits in describing the language, religion, and customs of the ancient Peruvians and Mexicans were both unwilling and incapable to perform so arduous an undertaking with justice and truth. They did not converse with the natives as friends, but despised, hated, and murdered them, for the sake of their gold and silver, and to excuse their own ignorance, and most shocking, cool, premeditated murders, they artfully described them as an abominable swarm of idolatrous cannibals offering human sacrifices to their various false deities, and eating of the unnatural victims. Nevertheless, from their own partial accounts, we can trace a near agreement between the civil and martial customs, the religious worship, traditions, dress, ornaments, and other particulars of the ancient Peruvians and Mexicans, and those of the present North American Indians. Acosta tells us, that though the Mexicans have no proper name for God, yet they allow a supreme omnipotence and providence, his capacity was not sufficient to discover the former, however, the latter agrees with the present religious opinion of the English-American Indians, of an universal divine wisdom and government. The want of a friendly intercourse between our northern and southern Indians, has in length of time occasioned some of the former a little to corrupt, or alter the name of the self-existent creator and preserver of the universe, as they repeat it in their religious invocations, why oh here are. But with what show of truth, consistent with the above concession, can Acosta describe the Mexicans as offering human sacrifices also to devils, and greedily feasting on the victims? We are told also that the Noatalcas believe they dwelt in another region before they settled in Mexico, that they wandered 80 years in search of it, through a strict obedience to their gods, who ordered them to go in quest of new lands, that had such particular signs, that they punctually obeyed the divine mandate, and by that means found out, and settled the fertile country of Mexico. This account corresponds with the Chicasa tradition of settling in their present supposed holy land, and seems to have been derived from a compound tradition of Aaron's rod, and the light or divine presence with the Israelites in the wilderness, when they marched. And probably the Mexican number of years, was originally 40, instead of 80. Lopez de Gamara tells us, that the Mexicans were so devout, as to offer to the sun and earth, a small quantity of every kind of meat and drink, before any of themselves tasted it, and that they sacrificed part of their corn, fruits, A and D C. In like manner, otherwise, they were deemed haters of, and contemned by their gods. Is not this a confused Spanish picture of the Jewish daily sacrifice?
they write that the Mexicans offered to one of their gods a sacrifice compounded of some of all the seeds of their country, grinded fine, and mixed with the blood of children and of sacrificed virgins, that they plucked out the hearts of those victims and offered them as first fruits to the idol, and that the warriors imagined the least relic of the sacrifice would preserve them from danger. They soon afterwards tell us of a temple of a quadrangular form called Tukali, God's house, and Chakalmua, a minister of holy things who belonged to it. They likewise speak of the hearth of God, the continual fire of God, the holy ark, and if we cut off the Jesuitical paintings of the unnatural sacrifice, the rest is consonant to what hath been observed concerning the North American Indians. And it is very obvious, the North and South American Indians are alike of vindictive tempers, putting most of their invading enemies that fall into their power to the fiery torture. The Spaniards looking upon themselves as divine ambassadors, under the imperial signature of the Holy Lord of Rome, were excessively enraged against the simple native South Americans, because they tortured 40 of their captivated people by reprisal, devoting them to the fire, and ate their hearts, according to the universal war custom of our northern Indians, on the like occasion. The Spanish terror and hatred on this account, their pride, religious, bigotry, and an utter ignorance of the Indian dialects, rites, and customs, excited them thus to delineate the Mexicans, and equally hard names, and unjust charges, the bloody members of their diabolical inquisition used to bestow on those pretended heretics, whom they gave over to be tortured and burnt by the secular power. But it is worthy of notice, the Spanish writers acknowledge that the Mexicans brought their human sacrifices from the opposite sea, and did not offer up any of their own people, so that this was but the same as our North American Indians still practice, when they devote their captives to death, which is ushered in with ablutions and other methods of sanctifying themselves, as have been particularly described, and they perform the solemnity with singing the sacred triumphal song, with beating of the drum, dances, and various sorts of rejoicings, through gratitude to the beneficent and divine author of success against their common enemy. By the description of the Portuguese writers, the Indian Brazilian method of war, and of torturing their devoted captives, very nearly resembles the customs of our Indians. Acosta, according to his usual ignorance of the Indian customs, says, that some in Mexico understood one another by whistling, on which he attempts to be witty, but notwithstanding the great contempt and surprise of the Spaniards at those Indians who whistled as they went, this whistle was no other than the war whoop, or a very loud and shrill shout, denoting death, or good or bad news, or bringing in captives from war, the same writer says they had three kinds of knighthood, with which they honored the best soldiers, the chief of which was the red ribbon, the next the lion, or tiger knight, and the meanest was the grey knight. He might with as much truth, have added the turkey buzzard knight, the sunblind bat knight, and the night owl knight. His account of the various gradations of the Indian war titles, shows the unskillfulness of that voluminous writer even in the first principles of his Indian subject, and how far we ought to rely on his marvelous works. The accounts the Spaniards formerly gave us of Florida and its inhabitants, are written in the same romantic strain with those of Mexico. Ramusius tells us, that Alvaro Nunez and his company reported the Apalachee Indians to be such a gigantic people, as to carry boughs, thick as a man's arm, and of eleven or twelve spans long, shooting with proportional force and direction. It seems they lived then a sober and temperate life, for Morg says, one of their kings was 300 years old, though Laudon reckons him only 250, and Morg assures us, he saw this young Indian Methuselah as father, who was 50 years older than his son, and that each of them was likely by the common course of nature to live 30 or 40 years longer, although they had seen their fifth generation. Since that time they have so exceedingly degenerated, in height of body, largeness of, 200 and defensive arms, and antediluvian longevity, that I am afraid, these early and extraordinary writers would scarcely know the descendants of those Appalach Anakim, if they now saw them. They are at present the same as their dwarfish red neighbors, sic transit gloria mundi. Nicholas Chalusius paints Florida full of winged serpents, he affirms he saw one there, and that the old natives were very careful to get its head, on account of some supposed superstition. Ferdinando Soto tells us, that when he entered Florida, he found a Spaniard, J. Ortez, 
whom the natives had captivated during the space of 12 years, consequently, he must have gained in that time sufficient skill in their dialect to give a true interpretation and account, and he assures us, that Usita, the lord of the place, made that fellow, temple keeper, to prevent the night wolves from carrying away the dead corpse, that the natives worshipped the devil, and sacrificed to him the life and blood of most of their captives, who spoke with them face to face, and ordered them to bring those offerings to quench his burning thirst. And we are told by Benzo, that when Soto died, the good-natured cacique ordered two likely young Indians to be killed according to custom, to wait on him where he was gone. But the Christian Spaniards denied his death, and assured them he was the son of God, and therefore could not die. If we accept the last sentence, which bears a just analogy to the presumption and arrogance of the popish priests and historians, time and opportunity have fully convinced us, that all the rest is calumny and fossid. It must be confessed, however, that none, even of the Spanish monks and friars, have gone so deep in the marvellous, as our own sagacious David Ingram, he assures us, that he not only heard of very surprising animals in these parts of the world, but saw elephants, horses, and strange wild animals twice as big as our species of horses, formed like a greyhound in their hinder parts, he saw likewise bulls with ears like hounds, and another surprising species of quadrupeds bigger than bears, without head or neck, but nature had fixed their eyes and mouths more securely in their breasts. At the end of his monstrous ideal productions, he justly introduces the devil in the rear, sometimes assuming the likeness of a dog, at other times the shape of a calf, and, although this legendary writer has transcended the bounds of truth, yet where he is not emulous of outdoing the Jesuitical romances, it would require a good knowledge of America to confute him in many particulars. This shows how little the learned world can rely on American narrators, and that the origin of the Indian Americans is yet to be traced in a quite different path to what any of those hyperbolical or wild conjectural writers have prescribed. The Spaniards have given us many fine polished Indian narrations, but they were certainly fabricated at Madrid. The Indians have no such ideas, or methods of speech, as they pretend to have copied from a faithful interpretation on the spot. However, they have religiously supported those monkish dreams, and which are the chief basis of their Mexican and Peruvian treaties. According to them, the Mexican arms was an eagle on a tunnel or stone, with a bird in his talons, which may look at the armorial ensign of Dan. And they say, the Mexicans worshipped Vitzlaputzli, who promised them a land exceedingly plenty in riches, and all other good things, on which account they set off in quest of the divine promise, for of their priests carrying their idol in a coffer of reeds, to whom he communicated his oracles, giving them laws at the same time, teaching them the ceremonies and sacrifices they should observe, and directed them when to march, and when to stay in camp, and so much might have been collected from them by signs, and other expressive indications, for we are well assured, that the remote uncorrupted part of the Mexicans still retain the same notions as our northern Indians, with regard to their arriving at, and settling in their respective countries, living under a theocratic government, and having the divine war arc, as a most sacred seal of success to the beloved people, against their treacherous enemies, if they strictly observe the law of purity, while they accompany it. This alone, without any reflection on the rest, is a good glass to show us, that the South and North American Indians are twin-born brothers, though the Spanish clergy, by, their dark but fruitful inventions, have set them at a prodigious variance. Acosta tells us, that the Peruvians held a very extraordinary feast called Utu, which they prepared themselves for, by fasting two days, not accompanying with their wives, nor eating salt meat or garlic, nor drinking chica during that period that they assembled all together in one place, and did not allow any stranger or beast to approach them, that they had clothes and ornaments which they wore, only at that great festival, that they went silently and sedately in procession, with their heads veiled, and drums beating, and thus continued one day and night, but the next day they danced and feasted, and for two days successively, their prayers and praises were heard. This is another strong picture of the rights of the Indian North Americans, during the time of their great festival, to atone for sin, and with a little amendment, would exhibit a surprising analogy of sundry essential rights and customs of the Northern and South American Indians, which equally glance at the Mosaic system. Lirius tells us, 
that he was present at the triennial feast of the Caribbeans, where a multitude of men, women, and children were assembled. But among all the Spanish friars, Hieronimo Roman was the greatest champion in hyperbolical writing. He has produced three volumes concerning the Indian American rites and ceremonies. He stretches very far in his second part of the Commonwealths of the world, but when he gets to Peru and Mexico, the distance of those remote regions enables him to exceed himself. Beyond all dispute, the other writers of his black fraternity are only younger brethren when compared to him in the marvelous. His is the chief of all the Spanish romances of Peru and Mexico. He says, the Indian natives, from Florida to Panama, had little religion or policy, and yet he affirms a few pages after, that they believed in one true, immortal and invisible God, reigning in heaven, called Yokawagna Maricote, and is so kind as to allow them images, priests, and popes, their high priest being called Papa in that language. The origin of images among them is accounted for in a dialogue he gives us, between a shaking tree and one of the Indian priests. After a great deal of discourse, the tree ordered the priest to cut it down, and taught him how to make images thereof, and erect a temple. The tree was obeyed, and every year their votaries solemnized the dedication. The good man has labored very hard for the images, and ought to have suitable applause for so useful an invention, as it shows the universal opinion of mankind, concerning idols and images. With regard to that long conjectural divine name, by which they expressed the one true God, there is not the least room to doubt, that the South Americans had the divine name, Yohiwa, in as great purity as those of the North, especially, as they were at the fountainhead, adding to it occasionally some other strong compound words. He says also, that the metropolis of Chololá had as many temples as there were days in the year, and that one of them was the most famous in the world, the basis of the spire being as broad as a man could shoot with a crossbow, and the spire itself three miles high. The temples which the holy man speaks of, seem to have been only the dwelling houses of strangers, who incorporated with the natives, differing a little in their form of structure, according to the usual custom of our northern Indians, and his religious principles not allowing him to go near the reputed shambles of the devil, much less to enter the supposed territories of hell, he has done pretty well by them, in allowing them golden suns and moons, vestry keepers, and the badness of his optic instruments, if joined with the supposed dimness of his sight, may plead in excuse for the spiral altitude, which he fixes at 15,480 feet, for from what we know of the northern Indians, we ought to strike off the three first figures of its height, and the remaining 40 is very likely to have been the just height of the spire, alias the red-painted, great, war pole. The same writer tells us, that the Peruvian pontifical office belonged to the eldest son of the king, or some chief lord of the country, and that it devolved by succession. But he anoints him after a very solemn manner, with an ointment which he carefully mixes with the blood of circumcised infants. This priest of war dealing so much in blood himself, without doubt, suspected them of the like, though at the same time no Indian priest will either shed, or touch human blood, but that they formerly circumcised may with great probability be allowed to the holy man. The temples of Peru were built on high grounds, or tops of hills, he says, and were surrounded with four circular mounds of earth, the one rising gradually above the other, from the outermost circle, and that the temple stood in the center of the enclosed ground, built in a quadrangular form, having altars, and, he has officiously obtruded the sun into it, perhaps, because he thought it dark within. He describes another religious house, on the eastern part of that great enclosure, facing the rising sun, to which they ascended by six steps, where, in the hollow of a thick wall, lay the image of the sun, and, this thick wall having an hollow part within it, was no other than their sanctum sanctorum, conformably to what I observed, concerning the pretended holiest place of the Muscogee Indians. Anyone who is well acquainted with the language, rites, and customs of the North American Indians, can see with a glance when these monkish writers stumble on a truth, or ramble at large. Acosta says, that the Mexicans observed their chief feast in the month of May, and that the nuns two days before mixed a sufficient quantity of beets with honey, and made an image of it. He trims up the idol very genteelly, and places it on an azure-colored chair, every way becoming the scarlet-colored pope. He soon after introduces flutes, drums, cornets, and trumpets, to celebrate the feast of Eupania Vitzlaputzli, 
as he thinks proper to term it, on account of the nuns, he gives them pania, feminine bread, instead of the masculine ponies, which he makes his nuns to distribute at this love feast, to the young men, in large pieces resembling great bones. When they receive them, they religiously lay them down at the feast of the idol, and call them the flesh and bones of the god Vitzlaputzli. Then he brings in the priests veiled, with garlands on their heads, and chains of flowers about their necks, each of them strictly observing their place, if the inquisitive reader should desire to know how he discovered those garlands and flowery chains, especially as their heads were covered, and they are secret in their religious ceremonies, I must inform him, that Acosta wrought a kind of cotton, or woolen cloth for them, much finer than silk, through which he might have easily seen them, besides, such a religious dress gave him a better opportunity of hanging a cross, and a string of beads afterwards round their necks. Next to those religious men, he ushers in a fine company of gods and goddesses, in imagery, dressed like the others, the people paying them divine worship, this without doubt, is intended to support the popish saint worship. Then he makes them sing, and dance round the paste, and use several other ceremonies. And when the eyes are tired with viewing those wild circlings, he solemnly blesses, and consecrates those morsels of paste, and thus makes them the real flesh and bones of the idol, which the people honor as gods. When he has ended his feast of transubstantiation, he sets his sacrifices to work, and orders them to kill and sacrifice more men than at any other festival, as he thinks proper to make this a greater carnival than any of the rest. When he comes to finish his bloody sacrifices, he orders the young men and women into two rows, directly facing each other, to dance and sing by the drum, in praise of the feast and the god, and he sets the oldest and the greatest men to answer the song, and dance around them, in a great circle. This with a little alteration, resembles the custom of the northern Indians. He says, that all the inhabitants of the city and country came to this great feast, that it was deemed sacrilegious in any person to eat of the honeyed paste, on this great festival day, or to drink water, till the afternoon, and that they earnestly advised those, who had the use of reason, to abstain from water till the afternoon, and carefully concealed it from the children during the time of this ceremony. But, at the end of the feast, he makes the priests and ancients of the temple to break the image of paste and consecrated rolls, into many pieces, and give them to the people by the way of sacrament, according to the strictest rules of order, from the greatest and eldest, to the youngest and least, men, women and children, and he says, they received it with bitter tears, great reverence, and a very awful fear, with other strong signs of devotion, saying at the same time, they, did not eat the flesh and bones of their God. He adds, that they who had sick people at home, demanded a piece of the said paste, and carried and gave it to them, with the most profound reverence and awful adoration, that all who partook of this propitiating sacrifice, were obliged to give a part of the feed of Mayais, of which the idol was made, and then at the end of the solemnity, a priest of high authority preached to the people on their laws and ceremonies, with a commanding voice, and expressive gestures, and thus dismissed. The Assembly Well may Acosta blame the devil in the manner he does, for introducing among the Mexicans, so near a resemblance of the popish superstitions and idolatry, but whether shall we blame or pity this writer, for obscuring the truth with a confused heap of faucets? The above is, however, a curious Spanish picture of the Mexican Passover, or annual expiation of sins, and of their second Passover in favor of their sick people, and of paying their tithes, according to similar customs of our North American Indians. We are now sufficiently informed of the rights and customs of the remote, and uncorrupt South Americans, by the Mississippi Indians, who have a communication with them, both in peace and war. Ribault Laudon describing the yearly festival of the Floridans, says, that the day before it began, the women sweeped out a great circuit of ground, where it was observed with solemnity, that when the main body of the people entered the holy ground, they all placed themselves in good order, stood up painted, and decked in their best apparel, when three Iowas, or priests, with different paintings and gestures followed them, playing on musical instruments, and singing with a solemn voice, the others answering them, that when they made three circles in this manner, the men ran off to the woods, and the women stayed weeping behind, cutting their arms with muscle shells, and throwing the blood towards the sun, and that when the men returned, the three days feast was finished. 
This is another confused Spanish draft of the Floridan Passover, or Feast of Love, and of their universal method of bleeding themselves after much exercise, which according to the Spanish writers tell us, that the Mexicans had a feast, and month, which they called Hueto Zolti, when the maize was ripe. Every man at that time bringing an handful to be offered at the temple, with a kind of drink, called Uchulai, made out of the same grain. But they soon deck up an idol with roses, garlands, and flowers, and describe them as offering to it sweet gums, and then they speedily dress a woman with the apparel of either the god, or goddess, of salt, which must be to season the human sacrifices, as they depicture them according to their own dispositions. But they soon change the scene, and bring in the god of gain, in a rich temple dedicated to him, where the merchants apart sacrifice vast numbers of purchased captives. It often chagrins an inquisitive and impartial reader to trace the contradictions, and chimerical inventions, of those aspiring bigoted writers, who speak of what they did not understand, only by signs, and a few chance words. The discerning reader can easily perceive them from what hath been already said, and must know that this Spanish mountain in labor, is only the Indian first fruit offering, according to the usage of our North American Indians. It is to be lamented that writers will not keep to matters of fact. Some of our own historians have described the Mohawks as cannibals, and continually hunting after man's flesh, with equal truth. Diodorus Siculus, Strabo, and others report, that in Britain there were formerly anthropophagi, man-eaters. Garcilaso de la Vega, another Spanish romancer, says, that the Peruvian shepherds worshipped the star called Lyra, as they imagined it preserved their flocks, but he ought first to have supplied them with flocks, for they had none except a kind of wild sheep, that kept in the mountains, and which are of so fetid a smell, that no creature is fond to approach them. The same aspiring fictitious writer tells us, the Peruvians worshipped the creator of the world, whom he is pleased to call Viracocha Pachiacha Ha Hik, any person who is in the least acquainted with the rapid flowing manner of the Indian American dialects will conclude from the wild termination that the former is not the Peruvian divine name. Next to this great creator of the universe, he affirms, they worship the sun, and next to the solar orb, they deified and worship thunder, believing it proceeded from a man in heaven, who had power over the rain, hail, and thunder, and everything in the aerial regions, and that they offered up sacrifices to it, but none to the universal creator. To prefer the effect to the acknowledged prime cause, is contrary to the common reason of mankind, who adore that object which they esteem either the most beneficent, or the most powerful. Monsieur Le Page du Prats tells us, he lived seven years, among the Nachi Indians, about 100 leagues up the Mississippi from New Orleans, and in order to emulate the Spanish romances of the Indians, in his performance, he affirms their women are double-breasted, which he particularly describes, and then following the Spanish copy, he assures us, the highest rank of their nobles is called sons, and that they only attend the sacred and eternal fire, which he doubtless mentioned. Merely to introduce his convex lens, by which he tells us with a great air of confidence, he gained much esteem among them, as by the gift of it, he enabled them to continue their holy fire, if it should casually be near extinguished. According to him, the Chikasa tongue was the court language of the Mississippi Indians, and that it had not the letter R. The very reverse of which is the truth, for the French and all their red savages were at constant war with them, because of their firm connection with the English, and hated their national name, and as to the language, they could not converse with them, as their dialects are so different from each other. I recited a long string of his well-known stories to a body of gentlemen, well skilled in the languages, rites, and customs of our East and West Florida Indians, and they agreed that the Quran did not differ more widely from the divine oracles, than the accounts of this writer from the genuine customs of the Indian Americans. The Spanish artists have furnished the savage war chieftain, or their Emperor Montezuma, with very spacious and beautiful palaces, one of which they raised on pillars of fine jasper, and another wrought with exquisite skill out of marble, jasper, and other valuable stones, with veins glistening like rubies, they have finished the roof with equal skill, composed of carved and painted cypress, cedar, and pine trees, without any kind of nails. They should have furnished some of the chambers with suitable pavilions and beds of state, but the bedding and furniture in our northern Indian huts, is the same with what they were pleased to describe, in the wonderful Mexican palaces. 
In this they have not done justice to the Grand Red Monarch, whom they raised up, with his 1,000 women, or 3,000 according to some, only to magnify the Spanish power by overthrowing him. Montezuma in an oration to his people, at the arrival of the Spaniards, is said by Malvenda, to have persuaded his people to yield to the power of his Catholic Majesty's arms, for their own forefathers were strangers in that land, and brought there long before that period in a fleet. The emperor, who they pretend bore such universal arbitrary sway, is raised by their pens, from the usual rank of a war chieftain, to his imperial greatness, but despotic power is death to their ears, as it is destructive of their darling liberty, and reputed theocratic government, they have no name for a subject, but say, the people. In order to carry on the self-flattering war romance, they began the epoch of that great fictitious empire, in the time of the ambitious and formidable Montezuma, that their handful of heaven-favored popish saints might have the more honor in destroying it, had they described it of a long continuance, they foresaw that the world would detect the fallacy, as soon as they learned the language of the pretended empire, correspondent to which, our own great Emperor Powhatan of Virginia, was, soon dethroned. We are sufficiently informed by the rambling Mississippi Indians, that Motoshuma is a common high war name of the South American leaders, and which the fate he is said to receive, strongly corroborates. Our Indians urge with a great deal of vehemence, that as everyone is promoted only by public virtue, and has his equals in civil and martial affairs, those Spanish books that have mentioned red emperors, and great empires in America, ought to be burnt in some of the remaining old years accursed fire. And this Indian fixed opinion seems to be sufficiently confirmed by the situation of Mexico, as it is only about 315 miles from south to north, and narrower than 200 miles along the northern coast, and lies between Tlaxcala and Mecoacan, to the west of the former, and east of the latter, whence the Mexicans were continually harassed by those lurking swift-footed savages, who could secure their retreat home, in the space of two or three days. When we consider the vicinity of those two inimical states to the pretended puissant empire of Mexico, which might have easily crushed them to pieces, with her formidable armies, in order to secure the lives of the subjects, and credit of the state, we may safely venture to affirm, from the long train of circumstances already exhibited, that the Spanish Peruvian and Mexican empires are without the least foundation in nature, and that the Spaniards defeated the tribe of Mexico, properly. Called Mexico, and chiefly, by the help of their red allies. In their descriptions of South America and its native inhabitants, they treat largely of heaven, hell, and purgatory, lions, salamanders, maids of honor, maids of penance, and their abbesses, men whipping themselves with cords, idols, matins, monastic vows, cloisters of young men, with a prodigious group of other popish inventions, and we must not forget to do justice to those industrious and sagacious observers, who discovered two Golgothas, or towers made of human skulls, plastered with lime. Acosta tells us, that Andrew de Topia assured him, he and Gonzalo de Vimbria reckoned 136,000 human skulls in them. The temple dedicated to the air, is likewise worthy of being mentioned, as they assert in the strongest manner, that 5,000 priests served constantly in it, and obliged everyone who entered, to bring some human sacrifice, that the walls of it were an inch thick, and the floor a foot deep, with black, dry, clotted blood. If connected herewith, we reflect, that beside this bloodthirsty god of the air, the Spaniards have represented them as worshipping a multitude of idol gods and goddesses, no less than 2,000 according to Lopez de Gamara, and sacrificing to them chiefly human victims, and that the friars are reported by a Spanish bishop of Mexico, in his letters of the year 1532, to have broken down 20,000 idols, and desolated 500 idol temples, where the natives sacrificed every year more than 20,000 hearts of boys and girls, and that if the noblemen were burnt to ashes, they killed their cooks, butlers, chaplains, and dwarfs L.I.I., and had a plenty of targets, maces, and ensigns hurled into their funeral piles, this terrible slaughter, points out to us clearly from their own accounts, that these authors either gave the world a continued chain of fossils, or those sacrifices, and human massacres they boastingly tell us of, would have, long before they came, utterly depopulated Peru and Mexico. With regard to Indian dwarfs, I never heard of, or saw any in the northern nations, but one in Ishtato, 
a northern town of the middle part of the Chire country, and he was a great beloved man. I shall now quote a little of their less romantic description, to confirm the account I have given concerning the genuine rites, and cust- Emmanuel de Maurice and Acosta affirm, that the Brazilians marry in their own family, or tribe. And Joe. De late. Says, they call their uncles and aunts, fathers and mothers, which is a custom of the Hebrews, and of all our North American Indians, and he assures us they mourn very much for their dead, and that their clothes are like those of the early Jews. Uyoa assures us, that the South American Indians have no other method of weaving carpets, quilts, and other stuffs, but to count the threads one by one, when they are passing the woof, that they spin cotton and linen, as their chief manufacture, and paint their cloth with the images of men, beasts, birds, fishes, trees, flowers, ANDC. And that each of those webs was adapted to one certain use, without being cut, and that their patience was equal to so arduous a task. According to this description, there is not the least disparity between the ancient North American method of manufacturing, and that of the South Americans. Acosta writes, that the clothes of the South American Indians are shaped like those of the ancient Jews, being a square little cloak, and a little coat, and the reverend. Mr. Thorogood, Anno 1650, observes, that this is a proof of some weight in showing their original descent, especially to such who pay a deference to Seneca's parallel arguments of the Spaniards having settled Italy, for the old mode of dress is universally alike, among the Indian Americans. Late, in his description of America, an Escarbatus, assure us, they often heard the South American Indians to repeat the sacred word hallelujah, which made them admire how they first attained it. And Malvenda says, that the natives of St. Michael had tombstones, which the Spaniards digged up, with several ancient Hebrew characters upon them, as, why is God gone away? And, he is dead, God knows. Had his curiosity induced him to transcribe the epitaph, it would have given more satisfaction, for, as they yet repeat the divine essential name, Yohi, Ta, Wa, so as not to profane it, when they mourn for their dead, it is probable, they could write or engrave it, after the like manner, when they first arrived on this main continent. We are told, that the South American Indians have a firm hope of the resurrection of their bodies, at a certain period of time and that on this account they bury their most valuable treasures with their dead, as well as the most useful conveniences for future domestic life, such as their bows and arrows, and when they saw the Spaniards digging up their graves for gold and silver, they requested them to forbear scattering the bones of their dead in that manner, lest it should prevent their being raised and united again. Vid suto ad solin. Benz. And hist. Peruve. Monsieur de Poutrincourt says, that, when the Canada Indians saluted him, they said ho ho ho, but as we are well assured, they express yo here are, in the time of their festivals and other rejoicings, we have reason to conclude he made a very material mistake in setting down the Indian solemn blessing, or invocation. He likewise tells us, that the Indian women will not marry on the graves of their husbands, soon after their decease, but wait a long time before they even think of a second husband that, if the husband was killed, they would neither enter into a second marriage, nor eat flesh, till his blood had been revenged, and that after childbearing, they observe the mosaic law of purification, shutting up themselves from their husbands, for the space of forty days. Peter Marta writes, that, that Indian widow married the brother of her deceased husband, according to the mosaic law, and he says, the Indians worship that God who created the sun, moon, and all invisible things, and who gives them everything that is good. He affirms the Indian priests had chambers in the temple, according to the custom of the Israelites, by divine appointment, as 1 Chronicles, chapter 11, verses 26 and 27. And that there were certain places in it, which none but their priests could enter, the holiest. And Key says also, they have in some parts of America, an exact form of king, priest, and prophet, as was formerly in Canaan. Robert Williams, the first Englishman in New England, who is said to have learned the Indian language, in order to convert the natives, believed them to be Jews, and he assures us, that their tradition records that their ancestors came from the southwest, and that they returned there at death, that their women separate themselves from the rest of the people at certain periods, 
and that their language bore some affinity to the Hebrew. Baron Lahontan writes, that the Indian women of Canada purify themselves after travail, 30 days for a male child, and 40 for a female, that during the said time, they live apart from their husband, that the unmarried brother of the deceased husband marries the widow, six months after his decease, and that the outstanding parties for war, address the great spirit every day till they set off, with sacrifices, songs, and feasting. We are also told, that the men in Mexico sat down, and the women stood, when they made water, which is a universal custom among our North American Indians. Their primitive modesty, and indulgence to their women, seem to have introduced this singular custom, after the manner of the ancient Mauritanians, on account of their scantiness of clothing, as I formerly observed. Lirius tells us, that the Indians of Brazil wash themselves ten times a day, and that the husbands have no matrimonial intercourse with their wives, till their children are either weaned, or grown pretty hardy, which is similar to the custom of these northern Indians, and that of the Israelites, as Hosey one. And 8. He says, if a Peruvian child was weaned before its time, it was called Ainsco, a bastard. And that if a Brazilian wounds another, he is wounded in the same part of the body, with equal punishment, limb for limb, or life for life, according to the Mosaic law, which, within our own memory, these Indian nations observed so eagerly, that if a boy shooting at birds, accidentally wounded another, though out of sight, with his arrow ever so slightly, he, or any of his family, wounded him after the very same manner, which is a very striking analogy with the Jewish retaliation. He likewise tells us, that their sachems, or emperors, were the heads of their church, and according to late. America, the Peruvians had one temple consecrated to the creator of the world, besides for other religious places, in resemblance of the Jewish synagogues. And Malvenda says, the American idols were mitered, as Aaron was. He likewise affirms, as doth Acosta, that the natives observed a year of jubilee, according to the usage of the Israelites. Benzo says, that the men and women incline very much to dancing, and the women often by themselves, according to the manner of the Hebrew nation, as in 1 Samuel.21 and 11. Especially after gaining a victory over the enemy, as in Judges. 11, 34, Zai. 21, 23, and 1 Sam. 18, 6, 7. Acosta tells us, that though adultery is deemed by them a capital crime, yet they at the same time set little value by virginity, and it seems to have been a bewailable condition, in Judea. He likewise says, they wash their, 216, a in newborn infants, in resemblance of the Mosaic law, as Ezek. 16, 9. And the Spaniards say, that the priests of Mexico, were anointed from head to foot, that they constantly wore their hair, till they were superannuated, and that the husband did not lie with his wife, for two years after she was delivered. Our northern Indians imitate the first custom, though in the second, they resemble that of the heathen by poling or trimming their hair, and with regard to the third, they always sleep apart from their wives, for the greater part of a year, after delivery. By the Spanish authorities, the Peruvians and Mexicans were polygamists, but they had one principal wife to whom they were married with certain solemnities, and murder, adultery, theft, and incest, were punished with death. But there was an exception in some places, with regard to incestuous intercourses, which is entirely consonant to the usage of the northern Indians. For as to incest, the Chirake marry both mother and daughter, or two sisters, but they all observe the prohibited laws of consanguinity, in the strictest manner. They tell us, that when the priests offered sacrifice, they abstained from women and strong drink, and fasted several days, before any great festival, that all of them buried their dead in their houses, or in high places, that when they were forced to bury in any of the Spanish churchyards, they frequently stole the corpse, and interred it either in one of their own houses, or in the mountains, and that Juan de la Torre took 500,000 pesos out of one tomb. Here is a long train of Israelitish customs, and, if we include the whole, they exhibit a very strong analogy between all the essential traditions, rites, customs, and of the South and North American Indians, though the Spaniards mix an innumerable heap of absurd chimeras and romantic dreams with the plain material truths I have extracted. 
I lately perused the first volume of the history of North America, from the discovery thereof by Sylvanus Americanus, printed in New Jersey, Anno 1761, from, I believe, the Philadelphia Monthly Paper. The South American natives wanted nothing that could render life easy and agreeable, and they had nothing superfluous, except gold and silver. When we consider the simplicity of the people, and the skill they had in collecting a prodigious quantity of treasures, it seems as if they gained that skill from their countrymen, and the Tyrians, who in the reign of Solomon exceedingly enriched themselves, in a few voyages. The conjecture that the Aborigines wandered here from captivity, by the northeast parts of Asia, over Kamskatska, to have their liberty and religion, is not so improbable, as that of their being driven by stress of weather into the Bay of Mexico, from the east. Though a single argument of the general subject, may prove but little, disjoined from the rest, yet, according to the true laws of history, and the best rules for tracing antiquities, the conclusion is to be drawn from clear corresponding circumstances united, the force of one branch of the subject ought to be connected with the others, and then judged by the whole. Such readers as may dissent from my opinion of the Indian American origin and descent, ought to inform us how the natives came here, and by what means they formed the long chain of rites, customs, so similar to the usage of the Hebrew nation, and in general dissimilar to the modes, and, of the pagan world. Ancient writers do not agree upon any certain place, where the offer of Solomon lay, it must certainly be a great distance from Joppa, for it was a three years voyage. After the death of Solomon, both the Israelites and Tyrians seem to have utterly discontinued their trading voyages to that part of the world. Eusebius and Eupolemus say, that David sent to earth, an island in the Red Sea, and brought much gold into Judea, and Ortelius reckons this to have been offer, though, agreeably to the opinion of the greater part of the modern literati, he also conjectures Cephala, or Sophila, to have been the offer of Solomon. Junius imagines it was in Aurea Cursonesis, Tremelius and Niger are of the same opinion. But Vatablus reckons it was Hispaniola, discovered, and named so by Columbus, yet Postellus, Phil, Mornay, Arius Montanus, and Garopius, are of opinion that Peru is the ancient offer, so widely different are their conjectures. Ancient history is quite silent, concerning America, which indicates that it has been time immemorial rent asunder from the African continent, according to Plato's Timius. The northeast parts of Asia also were undiscovered, till of late. Many geographers have stretched Asia and America so far, as to join them together, and others have divided those two quarters of the globe, at a great distance from each other. But the Russians, after several dangerous attempts, have clearly convinced the world, that they are now divided, and yet have a near communication together, by a narrow strait, in which several islands are situated, through which there is an easy passage from the northeast of Asia to the northwest of America by the way of Kamskatska, which probably joined to the northwest point of America. By this passage, supposing the main continents were separated, it was very practicable for the inhabitants to go to this extensive new world, and afterwards, to have proceeded in quest of suitable climates, according to the law of nature, that directs every creature to such climes as are most convenient and agreeable. Having endeavored to ascertain the origin and descent of the North American Indians, and produced a variety of arguments that incline my own opinion in favor of their being of Jewish extraction, which at the same time furnish the public with a more complete Indian system of religious rites, civil and martial customs, languages, than hath ever been exhibited, neither disfigured by fable, nor prejudice. I shall proceed to give a general historical description of those Indian nations among whom I have chiefly resided, 